So uh, the Gemara that we learned yesterday was talking about this uh, story of the rabbis they went to Yavne. And I mentioned the, that the, the rabbis um, had studied in a, this yeshiva in Yavne because the uh, Yavne was where all the Chachamim went at the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Rabbi Yechonin ben Zakkai had requested and he was granted his request that uh, Vespasian should uh, allow the, uh, Yavne and its Chachamim to live. And so the rabbis were able to um, uh, basically uh, continue their studies, not in Yushalayim, but in Yavne. And they, uh, the, the, uh, the Sanhedrin seemed to have uh, traveled and gone from Yavne, been at, been at Yavne, and then traveled away and then came back at one point. And so uh, the story over here is when they returned to Yavne, these rabbis came there and they wanted to say, they, when they came back, they, they gave like a big, they gave a speech. And their speech was supposed to be to open up to honor the the uh, the people who were the hosts, the Achsanya, the hosts that uh, that lived in Yavne. And one of the commentaries says that what well, you know for the big rabbis, it's very easy to find a place to eat, but for the um, the the students, they didn't necessarily want to invite the students. So Rabbi Yehuda uh, basically starts off his. Uh, his, his speech emphasizing the greatness of anyone that comes to learn Taita uh, and therefore bringing out maybe this idea that they should be proud to invite the students that are studying in Yavna. So like to have a big rabbi stay in your house, everyone's like, oh, sure, of course, you know, it's a great honor. Have the, the simple guy, eh, people aren't like so excited. So Rabbi Yehuda starts off his um, his speech. It, it, well, he starts off. He gives his uh, he gives his uh, his drasha over here. His peschem uh, He honors the 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 scholars, even though officially he's really supposed to be honoring the hosts. But it's basically the same thing. He's he's explaining how great these students are, and uh, ultimately uh, that will mean that the 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 hosts are also very uh, they're very lucky that they're having you know that they're going to be hosting these special students and his goal is to emphasize that anyone that comes to learn Torah is called a mevakesh Hashem you're called someone who seeks out Hashem and he brings a proof about calling someone who learns Torah, who comes to the yeshiva here, someone who's called the Mavake Hashem. He brings this as a brings a source from in the Torah where it talks about people going to the tent where Moshe Rabbeinu moved his tent. People would go there; they would call be called Mavakshe Hashem. So, Rabbi Huda says, if there are just for going a small distance, they're called Mavakshe Hashem, they're called seekers of God, so how much more so are you called a seeker of God when you when you uh, go, go come to Yavne and study Torah so these people are called Mavakshe Hashem they're called seekers of Hashem so th these are special people this very special thing, they're called Mavakshe Hashem so this is seemingly what Rabbi Yehuda is, uh, is, is, is trying to explain. There are a number of questions on his, um, uh, uh, his, uh, his teaching. A number of issues with his teaching. Is, well, one of the issues is that they're going to, to study with Moshe. So maybe only there they're called Mavakshe Hashem. But if you go to study in Yavna, maybe you're not called a Mavakesh Hashem, a seeker of God. You know, Moshe, the, the holiest, uh, such a holy person, such a great person, the greatest prophet. 
Maybe specifically, Moshe, you call them Avake Hashem. Additionally, where Moshe was, they also was the Ark there. Now, that could be a reason you call them Avake Hashem when you go to the Ark. So maybe that's why it's called the Mavake Shashem. Or maybe because you have all both. You have both the Ark and Moshe. You're called a seeker of God. And maybe if you just go to study in Yavne, maybe you wouldn't be called a seeker of God. So these are some of the questions that could be asked on this Gemara. And um, commentaries, they struggle to, to, uh, uh, to, to explain it. But um, the... Uh, the, 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 the simple understanding is that there's a term used here that uh, maybe uh, emphasizes that they're coming to study Torah, but at the same time, they're called Mavakshe Hashem. They're not coming for the Ark. They're coming to, to learn Torah. And because they're coming to learn Torah, so you wouldn't say they're Mavake Hashem because the Ark is there. You would basically uh, understand the fact that they're coming to learn to, to learn Torah, that that is the reason why they're being given this name called Mavakshe Hashem. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the message that Rebbe Yehuda is giving, so we tried to explain why is Rebbe Yehuda the 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 one that's given the honor to give this first speech. So there's a few explanations given. One of them was the Rashi's explanation that that Rabbi Yehuda was always given that honor because the government gave him that honor. In other words, this was like a uh, directive from the government that we had to honor Rabbi Yehuda because he he spoke positive about the Romans. They liked that. So they gave him this honor that whenever anyone rabbis are speaking, he's supposed to get the first first licks. He's supposed to be able to have the first uh, be honored with the first speech. The um, uh, the other explanation is very interesting. Rabbi Yehuda in the Haggadah. What is Rabbi Yehuda known for? In the Haggadah, he's known for. Rabbi Yehuda Hayanoisin Bahem Simonim. Rabbi Yehuda is known for giving a summarized version. How did he do the ten makos, the ten plagues? Rabbi Yehuda did the ten plagues in a in a, in a summarized version. He didn't do, do the whole dam akinim. He said, no, you can summarize it all and just do it. So when they, since Rabbi Yehuda was great at summarizing his speeches. They said he's the one who gets to speak first because they like to, you know, they like the short and sweet speech. So Rabbi Yehuda was the one who, uh, who was known for his uh, summarization and being able to uh, make things concise. So they, they gave Rabbi Yehuda this honor. It's brought one safer, this, uh, this shot. Um, and then there's a, there's a third shot that I saw that has to do with the fact that Rabbi Yehuda is, somehow connected in his origin to somehow maybe a reincarnation or some, something to do with the fact that he is named after Yehuda, the son of Yaakov. And uh, uh, Yehuda was uh, the, the, uh, the king, so to speak. So, of course, he should, uh, he should be, the, uh, give, be given that honor of being the first to, to speak. Yes, uh, David. Why did he speak in favor of the Romans? Well, there was a discussion going on, and uh, Reb Shimon Bar Yochai spoke negatively that they're doing it all for their own honor. And Reb Yehuda had said initially, "It's so nice what they built up for us." So he was, you know, he was. Uh, yeah, they were schmoozing, and he had said something. He had spoken positive, and Reb Shimon Bar Yochai didn't like it because he says, you know. The chesed uh, umim chatos, you know, like uh, uh, they're doing it for their own uh, uh, honor, their own grandeur. They're they're they're, they're doing it for themselves. They they, they want to, they want it to, to show off and so on. So Shimon Bar Yochai was very uh, um, 
very strict on on, on them. And uh, Rabbi Yehuda had been sort of like very, uh, you know, he just said it in a very casual way of just, you know, so nice that they built this up and so on. So they uh, they took that as a, uh, uh, you know, as something, a nice uh, gesture on uh, on Rabbi Yehuda's uh, part. And they said from now on, they, they gave him honor. And Rabbi Shem Yechai, they tried to kill him. Of course, he ran away and ran into the uh, the cave with his son. And that's the, the story of, uh, you know, the, the, the story of the, uh, of, the cave, of the Zohar. That's where we get the Zohar from, from that 12 years, 13 years in the, in the cave. Okay, so um, so that's the it's a story in Tractate Shabbos. Everybody, did you send the did you send the note about the speaker for the four uh, Thursdays? I did send something. Yes, did you? you didn't, did you? Did you get I it? I didn't see it. Maybe I have to look hard. I, I got one today. You got it. It's, yeah. it's a it's it's basically a timeline. Flyer. Okay, I didn't look today. Okay. It's a timeline that he's giving everyone to uh, to uh, to be able to jot down some notes while he speaks. I know it's three Thursdays, then a skip, and then another Thursday. Yeah, listen, I, I didn't I make the calendar. That. I remember That's that. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so let's read this Gemara inside one more time. The Gemara here says, Tanu Rabbonon, we're on page 63b, and we're going we're gonna to go over the Gemara that we did yesterday, um, because, as I said, it's a little, it was a little confusing, the, uh, the, the lima, the, the teaching. So uh, he's basically expounding on some verses, in, uh, expounding on, on a verse, on, on some verses in Parshas Kisisa about uh, Moshe uh, taking his tent and moving it outside of the camp. And it had to do with, of course, the sin of the golden calf. The golden calf, the, the, uh, the, it says Hashem said he's going to send an angel. He didn't want to lead us. He wanted to destroy us, of course. Then he said he'll send an angel. And then uh, Moshe said, uh, basically, that if, uh, if, if Hashem, so to speak, is not going to be with the camp, it's menuda l'rav, that's the term, is you're excommunicated for the master, so you should be excommunicated from his main student. So, and therefore, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu moved his tent out of the camp. And now let's, let's read it inside. So the Tanah Rabban and the rabbis learned. We are about uh, 12, maybe 15 lines from the top of the page, 63b. The rabbis learned. When the rabbis entered the vineyard in Yavne, Hayusham Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yaisi, Rabbi Nechemya, Rabbi Eliezer, Benayshel, Rabbi Yisrael, Lili. There were a few rabbis that uh, that were there, and uh, they gave speeches. Paschal Kula, Bechvay Rachsanya. They both, all, all of these rabbis, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yisrael, Rabbi Nechemya, Rabbi Eliezer, Benayshel, Rabbi Yisrael, Lili. These rabbis, they uh, they got they start they they opened with Bechvay Rachsanya, the honor of the for the hosts. So first they this is how they started. V'darshu and they darshan. Pasach Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda started. Reish HaMadabrim, and as we just explained, a few reasons why he's called the Reish HaMadabrim, the, the, the first of this of the speakers. And he was given this honor. V'chol Maka, Reish HaMadabrim, V'chol Maka. He is the first of the speakers in, 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 in all places. In other words, in general, he was given that honor. And he started B'chvay Teira, honoring the Teira. So that's how he started his speech. He started his, his, gave his introduction here because he wanted to, as I mentioned, he wanted to honor the students that are coming. He wanted to emphasize how special they are. They're called Mevakshe Hashem. And that's how what we're going to soon see. They're called seekers of God. Moshe took the tent, which means his tent, and he pitched it outside of the camp. So his, camp, his tent originally was in the camp, and now he moved it outside of the camp. And uh, we need to know that in order to understand the next piece. Behold, this is a this is a, a priori argument. 
Uma Oren Hashem, the Ark of God, Shaloi Haya Meruchak, Elashne Maser Mil, it was only far 12 mil. Amra Taira, the Taira says, Vahaya called Mavakish Hashem, anyone who seeked Hashem, Yetze had to go out, El Oyel Maye, to the tent of meeting. So the Ark of Hashem, which basically means the Ark that held the broken tablets, because again, we didn't build the Mishkan yet. And uh, so all that there was was basically the tablets that were broken uh, from when the spies came back. And um, and uh, Moshe uh, uh, was told from Hashem, go down, lech raid, ki uh, amcha, uh, your nation has uh, done a, you know, has been, has been, has been, uh, Done, done a sin, has sinned, and uh, they had worshipped the idol, and uh, Moshe Rabbeinu smashed the tablets. So those tablets, so there's, so they're in this ark, and the ark of Hashem was only 12 mil far from the whole camp, because the camp itself was only 12 mil. So uh, the, the furthest you could be from the ark was 12 mil. And uh, the ark, at least the way the Gemara is understanding it, is the ark was in Moshe's tent. And so when Moshe moved his tent outside of the camp, so now people in the camp, how far were they from the ark? They could have been very close, but they could have been 12 mil. So the most far you could be is basically 12 mil. Maybe uh, 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 um, um it says he, he, he can't be put it outside of the 12 mil. So uh, if you want to be precise, you could say it's really 13 mil. But the uh, Gemara uses the term 12 mil because that's how far the camp was. And he put it right outside the camp within the Tchum Shabbos, within the, uh, within the Tchum, which is the, the boundary. In other words, he put it outside the camp, but it was uh, a one extra within one extra mil. So it's 12 plus, uh, plus some change, you know, 12 plus some change, but it was 12 mil far from the, you might've been 12 mil, you might've been closer, but you might've been 12 mil. So the Gemara is understanding that Moshe took the Ark of Hashem, possibly, um, I shouldn't say possibly, up to, up to would be better, up to 12 and change mil. Um, now, a mill, we said, is 2,000 amois, which is about 3,000 feet, is, uh, maybe 4,000 feet. So it's about the three quarters of a mile. And uh, that's how much a mill is. A 12 mil would have been, I don't know, eight miles or so, you know, something like that. So uh, that's how big the whole camp of the Jewish people was. And um, and so it says that uh, um, Amra Teira, the Teira says about this, Hashem, anyone who seeks Hashem, should go out to the Oyal Mayed. So it doesn't say Ba El Oyal Mayed, it says Yetse will go out. So it's giving this concept, giving this idea that's teaching us this that Mavakesh Hashem, someone who's really seeking Hashem, is someone who has to go out. You have to go somewhere to be called a Mavakesh, a seeker of Hashem. In other words, if you go next door, or you go to your dining room and you learn Torah, you're not necessarily called him a vakish Hashem. Here it uses the term Yetze. So more understands it means you have to travel somewhat. But how far do you have to travel to be called someone who seeks out Hashem? You're a, you seek out God. So it says a vakish, anyone that seeks out Hashem will, will, will go out to the Oyel Mayed, which means right out of the camp. And that would mean that you might go as much as 12 mil. And, which is not too far, and you're already called a seeker of Hashem. But scholars that go from city to city, from state to state, to learn Torah, how much more so should they be called Hashem, seekers of Hashem. So, so he's expounding on this idea that the the the, uh, the 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 students who are traveling to come to Yavne, 
they're called Mevakshe Hashem. So they're not, they're no small, this is no small feat. They're, they, these are seekers of God. Now, in order to understand this, I think it's important to emphasize that learning Torah doesn't automatically mean that you are a Mavakesh Hashem, you're a seeker of Hashem. It could be. But the travel, the fact that you're traveling to go, that is giving you that extra title that you are someone who's going out of your comfort zone and you're going to seek out Hashem. And uh, because of that, you deserve some type of honor. Yes, Ben. I wanted to say eight miles is quite a camp because most suburbs today are less than eight miles. I know our suburb is a very big suburb and it's not more than eight miles. So it was quite, quite a large camp that they had. Well, they did have 600,000 men from the age of 20 to yeah, 60, yeah, which is about three, 3 million people. And, uh, and they all camped around. They didn't have, I don't know if they had mansions. So they probably, you know, the, they, they didn't need a huge amount of area. I don't know how much area they have. Well, they did have animals. Yeah. That's, so that's why Moses quite, moved outside the 12, outside the camp to make a little room for the people to come in. <laughs> well, maybe he wanted to have a good night's sleep. Right. No, but um, um, no, it's it is there, a huge camp. That's a huge area. Okay, okay. But when it comes to traveling, what the Gemara's understanding is the scholars who come to travel to the difference from city, different cities and different states, they're coming from far, from from far, and so that that they deserve. You know, if people walked eight miles to to. To, to learn I don't Torah. know that they walk eight miles to shul today, you know, on Shabbat, on a holiday. It's a, it's a long way to go. I know that we walk here three miles, four was the most, I think, that somebody walked, uh -huh. you know, to uh -huh. shul, and, and that, that's far. Right, right. Well, keep in mind that they did have a cloud of glory covering them, so it wasn't as hot or you know, as as it would be in like Florida, you know, because they but it didn't would have, take a long time to do the walk, you know. Yeah, but they didn't have to. They didn't sweat as much, and they also had yeah. automatic shower because yeah. their clothing and their shower it was all natural. Hashem made it that they didn't, you know, that they sort of uh, uh, they were always clean. So it was uh, it was easier than it would be for uh, for a regular yeah. person uh, today, probably. But um, but yet, it is called them. They are called mevakshe Hashem. They're called people who seek out Hashem. So I was, I was gonna, I was mentioning that, you know, it's it, studying Torah. Of course, we're learning Hashem's wisdom, but you don't always, you don't always see that Hashem. This is the wisdom of Hashem. Sometimes you see it as intellectual stimulation. And, you know, it could be missed out. And it could be that's what, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a thought, that it could be that Rabbi Yehuda is emphasizing this to the hosts. And he's telling them, you know, you might question, you know, the holy rabbis, the ones that are great, you know, holy people. They're, every time they learn Torah, they're connecting to, the, to Hashem and they're thinking they're it's part of their, you know, real service of Hashem. But maybe the young scholars, the ones that aren't uh, so uh, advanced, maybe they're, they're enjoying the intellectual study. But maybe they're not really seeing Hashem in the words. And here, Rabbi Yudha says, but they traveled. They traveled all the way here. They are called Mavakshe Hashem. They will ultimately see Hashem in the words. They might not see Hashem now, and you might be right that they're not exactly... On the, they're not in the league of the greater scholars, but they traveled all the way here and they came in order to learn Torah. Now, when they're learning, maybe they're not exactly seeing Hashem in the words, but their travel here is, gives them that term of Mavakshe Hashem. 
They're called seekers of Hashem, and they deserve credit accordingly. So that's uh, just a, a little thought of maybe. Yeah, uh, maybe Yavne was not. Yavne was not close enough for most of them, like Jerusalem was. You know, so that's why it was a longer distance for them to go. Listen, so 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 some of the rabbis they so, so one of the commentaries mentions that the, there are four rabbis here, and he's actually referring to all four of them, or, or all three of them. That some of them traveled, uh, that it mentions where they're from. Um, for example, Reb Yehuda, Reb Yosi, and Reb Nechemia. Um, maybe they they came from uh, some other city, and Rabbi Eliezer came from a whole other area, from and the Galil, uh, because his father was a Galil. Galil. Ah, Galil. Maybe that's the shot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so basically, these were you know these were the. Uh, this is referring to these rabbis themselves that they actually came from. Uh, they came from uh, different cities, and uh, and yet they're um, you know they're they're traveling here to learn Torah, uh, so they uh, they deserve that. You know this is a this is a, a big deal traveling here to learn Torah. If, if, if the twelve mil was enough considered Bavakshi Hashem, here how much more so? Yeah. So that is the uh, that is the first. Uh, 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 teaching. Then the Gemara continues, and it says that let's continue expounding on this on this verse. So it says, "Vidibur Hashem," or, or on a similar verse connected to it, I should say, that because uh, the other pasuk was uh, Zion. This is Yudalit. But it's a close pasuk in the same uh, the same paragraph. So the Diber Hashem al Moshe Panim al Panim. Hashem spoke to Moshe face to face. Now, Amr Reb Yitzchak, Reb Yitzchak says that Amr Le Kadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem said to Moshe, Moshe, Ani Viato, Moshe, you and I, Nazbir Panim Baalacha. Let's uh, share. Uh, Teachings in halacha, studying the law. And what does Nazbir Panim mean? Nazbir Panim means we should enjoy together our teaching. We should uh, show each other a uh, Nazbir Panim, uh, like a. Uh, Be nice to each other, is Nazbir Panim too. Right. Well, it, it's a certain kindness, of pre, uh, like a. Uh, a, a, a happy countenance to each other while we're uh, teaching teaching uh, halacha to each other. Now, why does he expound it this way? Why does he teach that this is what it means? Uh, let's see. Uh, Rashi over here says that um, Amra Torah. One second. No, it's on the next piece. Okay. That. Uh, uh, so 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 what why is he expounding this verse this way? This verse says that that Hashem spoke to Maisha Panim Bapanim. Now there's a contradiction to another verse. Everyone knows the famous verse where it says that Hashem, that you could see my back, but you can't see my face. So what does it mean that Hashem spoke to Moshe, Panim, El Panim, face to face? Is it possible? I thought Hashem, I thought uh, you could see my back. You can't really see my face. So because of that question, Rabbi Yitzchak says, you have to learn it a little differently. That Hashem said to Moshe, that uh, Hashem, Hashem said to Moshe, uh, let's uh, um, study the Torah together and uh, and, and show each other a happy countenance while we're studying together. Now, um, there is a Gemara that mentions that in order to learn Torah, you have to show, a teacher has to show a kind face. <coughs> Otherwise, um, um, if you have a more strict face, 
uh, the student will not be able to absorb the Torah properly. So there is such a Gemara that emphasizes this idea. So it seems to be connected to that Gemara as well, that um, in order to study Torah, you can only, in order to acquire Torah, you need to, the teacher has to show a kind face. Now, um, Now the question would be: So why does so why does Moshe have to also show a kind face to Hashem? It would seem that it's enough that Hashem shows a kind face to Moshe. But this is a well-known teaching in Hasidic teachings, at least that kemayim uh, hapanim al panim says uh, just like uh, your face, you, you however you present your face into water. That's how you see it. In other words, a mirror, if you did, everything's a mirror. The same thing applies with Hashem, that the way you present to Hashem, that's how Hashem presents back to you. It's, uh, uh, it's reciprocal. And so if, uh, if it was just Hashem showing a kind face to Moshe, it wouldn't have lasted. Uh, Moshe has to show a kind face also to Hashem to be able to, to, to cause Hashem to continue showing a kind face to him, that's the way Hashem made the world. That by us, by by Isarusa de Lasata, by an awakening from below, by doing action below, it sort of it, it awakens uh, uh, above, and so it's a it's a two way street, so to speak. So here we have the uh, the Gemara saying that uh, um, Hashem told Moshe, "Let us." Uh, show each other a kind face in learning, in learning halacha, learning law, studying the law. Then the Gemara says, Ika the Amri, some say a little differently that oh. another version, another version of this, um, uh, of this teaching that Vishav, uh, that Kach uh, Amalek that Hashem said as follows to Moshe. Kashem Shani his barti lochapanim, just I showed just as I showed you a kind face in Torah. So uh the teaching. Kach Ata Hasbrapanim Li Yisrael, you also should show a kind face to the Yiddin. Vahir Ha Oyal, the Makai might return the the tent that your uh, your tent, return it back to the camp. In other words, don't stay outside the camp. Go back and bring it back into the camp. And that's what it continues with Vishav al that the next verse, that the, the, the verse continued, the next words are Vishav el hamachana, and um, the next words in that same verse is, and you, and uh, you, Will return to shove, or he returns to the camp. Um, Rebavo um, says, Amalai Kodesh Baruch Hu Maisha, Shem told Maisha, Achshav, now, Yoimru, they will say, Harav Bekas, the Talmud Bekas. The master is angry, and the student is angry, and people are going to say um, uh, that we're both angry. Why? Because your your tent is not with the Kla Yisrael. It's you moved it outside of the camp, and in your tent is the ark that has the tablets, the broken tablets. Uh, and so we're both angry. Then Yisrael Mate Aleim. What about the Jews? What who's gonna how how are we gonna uh, uh, you know if we're both angry, who's gonna uh, bring them uh, some comfort? So Hashem tells Moshe, at least, at least return. You should return to the camp. If you return your your tent to the camp, good. And if not, Yeshua ben Nun Talmidcha, Yeshua ben Nun, your student Mesharis Tachtecha, he is going to serve as your substitute. He's going to take you over. And so this is the uh, teaching of uh, of the fact that. That that Moshe is told that you know sounded like a good idea for you to take your your tent out of the camp because you wanted to follow your teacher, meaning Hashem, 
Hashem said he's not going to lead the Jewish people anymore. I'll send an angel. And uh, Moshe then takes his, Hashem is angry with Kala Yisrael. And Moshe takes his tent and he moves it outside of the camp. But Hashem tells him, this is not the way to do things. You got to move your tent back amongst the people. The Shab al And according to this, the Shav al means like a command. The Shav and you should, or he should. The Shav al maybe it's a, maybe it's a, I guess a, a grammar would allow it to be considered in you. And you should return. The Shav, Shav or Shuv, the Shuv, like similar to Shuv al the Shav al Um Now, the, um, the, uh, the Gemara continues and it says, and this is the meaning of a shav that it's uh, telling us that it, it, it's, it's telling us that Hashem told Maisha this command return to the camp. And so obviously uh, Maisha did that and he returned the tent to the camp. But nevertheless, Amarava Afal came, nevertheless, it did not. The, the words of Hashem did not go for nothing. What does that mean? That there is a there is a Gemara that says that uh, when a hilalas chacham afilo al tnai he bought that if a, a great scholar gives a curse, even if he gives it on a condition, the fact that the curse was expressed it has an, it has an impact, even if the condition doesn't take effect, the curse still has an impact so much more so Hashem, Hashem sort of gave this uh, 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 punishment, told Moshe that, uh, you, you know, I'll, I'll substitute you for Yeshua. In the end, that's what happened. Of course, it didn't happen right away, but the fact that the words came out from Hashem, so those words did not go in vain, and ultimately, they had effect by the fact that when Moshe passed away, Yeshua took over. Yes, David. Uh, yeah, two things. One is the regarding the uh, grammar. So Steinsaltz translates it as, and he would return into the camp. Like, like it was something like it was an ongoing thing, that he would do this. And the second That's thing That's an interesting is, one. Does he expound on that at all at the bottom? That no. he would, like back and forth? It's that, is That's that what, what it you're sounds like. Uh -huh. yes, it, it, it says doesn't he would seem to fit. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem to fit the Gemara, but that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, what does it say? It, it says he would return into the camp, but his minister, Yoshua ben Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tent. So in other words, it was like an often thing that he would return into the camp. This, this was something he was wont to do. He would return, as far as the grammar goes, of the shove. And what about Yoshua? Uh, that he would, uh, he, did, he did not depart out of the tent. So what happens when the tent moves? Then he moved with the tent. So wherever it moved back and forth. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, that's a, uh, I mean, I, I, at least doesn't seem to flow too well because the Gemara seems to make it like a set thing that you should return if you return. So, uh-huh. Okay, listen, it's, uh, it's it, you, it doesn't say it so clearly. You're just getting that implication from, from the Steinsaltz. Okay, what's yeah. the second thing? Second thing I forget, I'll have to remember and to oh, okay. interrupt again, sorry. No problem, no problem, no problem. Does it? Okay, well. Um, but Steinsel said that Moshe listened and returned the, the, the Oehu. Does he say that he went back and forth or it was stayed? He no. returned it to the camp. No. Amar Rabba, Afal Pishet Siyat Moshe, Beazir et Oehu. לא יצא הדבר שנאמר על תפקידו של יהושע לבטלה. That's something else. But it says that he, he listened and he moved his, his tent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, I think, I think 
maybe I'm wrong, but I think that maybe Rabbi Steinsaltz, what you're reading is the understanding of the verse before our Gemara expounds on it. In other words, the, the initial understanding of that verse was, as you said it, that Moshe did go back and forth, and when they would go, the, the community would stand up, and they would look, and then he would come back. It, you know, it was a, the verse, the simple reading of the story is as, you know, that it's, it's not saying a command, it's saying that that's what he would do, would go back and forth. But our Gemara seems to be making this as a expounding on it in another, another a deeper layer, and saying that the that there's a deeper layer here, and it really it, it's it's emphasizing that Moshe at one point took his whole tent away, and Hashem said, "No, now return your tent to the uh, to the camp," and like that was a done deal. So maybe I, I'm just uh, I'm uh, reading from the Steinsalz too, yeah. but it yeah. says anyway. that Rabbi Rabba Hamar that uh, that he returned to the te the tent. He okay, anyway. The tent. That's that's just my thought. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's why it's, it sounds that way. Okay, we're going to continue. So, Vaid Pazach Reb Yehuda, and Reb Yehuda also. He, I remember he, the second thing. Yeah. If I can. What's the, second? the second thing is you were saying about how a person, uh, a tzaddik, when he says something, even if it's conditional, it has an effect. So this can also be by a regular person. It it, it has such an effect. Uh, my my mother told me that when I was born. When they were wheeling her out of the delivery room, she said, not for another 10 years. And uh, <laughs> she didn't have my sister until 10 years later. She, she didn't give birth again until 10 years wow. had gone by. Wow. Wow. She kept her word. Hashem kept her word. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... So it's a good point of it that the person has to be very careful. Al tiftach pel satan, that you don't want to say anything that could have, uh, you know, could have an impact. Because words bring, you know, they bring out certain things into reality. And so, in fact, one of the reasons why the uh, The Jewish people didn't want uh, Zechariah to give his nevuah about the destruction was because they felt if he didn't say it, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't happen. But by saying it, that's what actually caused, that's what would cause it to happen. And therefore they, uh, they some of them, uh, they killed Zechariah, fortunately. But uh, the... Um, the uh, in general, a person should be has to be careful in any words that they say. You know, to, to only speak positive because Chas Shalom just saying a word. But how much more so uh, a tzaddik or a, or a uh, chacham? It says kilas chacham, and how much more so Hashem that uh, that the words don't go in vain. So the Gemara continues and says that Rabbi Huda introduced bechvayd Torah v'darash and he darshed even more. He expounded even more. And he said, Haskes, pay attention, Ushma Yisrael, and listen, Israel, today you have become a nation. Now, keep in mind, this is at the end of 40 years. And so they didn't really become a nation today. They really had become a nation 40 years earlier when they got to Torah. So what does he mean in the verse when it says, today you became a nation? So that day was that the day when the Torah was given? What do you mean? It was given. This is the end of 40 years. 40 years earlier is when they became a nation when they got to Torah. Ella, this teaches us. Rather, to teach you that the Torah is um, cherished. By those who learn it, every day, in other words, every day it is cherished by those who learn it, as if that was the day that it was given at Mount Sinai. Amr Rav Tanchum Braid Rav Chia Ishkvar Aku, Rav Tanchum says, 
Heida, I can prove this to you. This is surely the way, this is surely so. There's a person says Shema in the morning and in the evening. And And if one evening he doesn't recite it, he feels like he never said Shema ever. He feels like he missed out in this major, major thing. And you feel like you, you never uh, said Shema properly. And the reason is because we consider it very cherished that this is like it was just commanded. It's a very awful feeling if a person missed the Shema. Luckily, uh, many people say the entire Shema before they go to bed. So even if they uh, miss Mairav, at least they could say, at least they said the Shema at night. They might have missed Mairav and it happens once in a while. You know, you, somehow you thought you went to Shul or you, you normally go to Shul, you didn't go to, and uh, might have, but at least Shema. But if you miss my Shema, you feel like what an what an awful feeling. Now, um, now it's interesting that it doesn't say Shema in the morning. It only says Shema in the evening. The erev echad in a You didn't say it in the evening. What about the morning? So it seems that maybe the morning you don't feel as bad because, well, first of all, maybe the morning is less practical to miss it. But the other option is maybe you slept through. But if you slept through, at least you were a shaygig or an inus. In night, you were irresponsible. At night, you, you simply didn't remember your obligation in the morning okay so you slept you slept but at night you know may, maybe it's considered more of a, a serious uh thing that you missed it at night than than in the uh than in the morning i'm just just offering a thought there why it says the evening maybe just because it's practical at the evening to forget the shema in the morning in the morning you go david first thing you're doing yes david um if a person is, why does it say evening first? Because then day begins in the evening. And once he said it in the evening, in a way, he said Shema at least once for that entire day. That covers the entire 24 hours coming. That's one possibility. Then the second thing is it, it says in the, uh, in the Steinsaltz Gemara, it says, it's as if he never recited Shema. What does it mean? He cannot compensate for what he missed. Right. It's not something you could make up. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, a crookedness that you can't uh, straighten, can't fix. That's a, that's a good point. It connects this Gemara with the earlier Gemara that we, uh, that we learned about the Zesha Bito Priyash Mashal Shachris, Priyash Mashal Arvis, that if a person missed it, you can't really make it up. Now, about mm -hmm. what you said about the, uh, the, if you said the night Shema, so at least you did a Shema, that's an interesting point of it because uh, it's a, it, I think it's brought in the, um, uh, I think it's brought this question of the, is, is it two separate mitzvahs? Is the Shema two separate mitzvahs, the night and the morning? Or is it a, is it is it one mitzvah the entire the uh, the night and the morning is it considered one mitzvah? And I think there's a shagasarya about it. I think there's a I think there's discussion about this uh, question. I have to look it up. But uh, that's that's what it boils down to. If it's two separate mitzvahs, so then you missed the night. If you if you did the night shema, it doesn't really help you in the morning shema. That's a separate mitzvah. So you did it this month. You did it the, yeah last night. You did it, it's a separate mitzvah. But if it's one mitzvah, then you got a good answer. Maybe this is a source for that. 
that see it's one mitzvah it's, that's why it says it says the night one that it's um that because it's one myth that's an interesting thought okay well um uh, thanks for bringing that up is that, that it doesn't say in the stein so that's your own thought i, I guess right Okay, well, well, well said. It's a nice, uh, in, nice thought because it, it it brings up a discussion that has to be, uh, you know, that I believe it's discussed. Maybe it's even a machlikas rishonim if it's one mitzvah or two mitzvahs. Um. Okay, did it? Someone else have a question, Ben? Did you want the, to say something? I wanted to say the morning shema would be more different to miss because you still have to put the tefillin on and pray. So right, you didn't right. practically do it in, in bed. You're doing it in shul. So right, right, right. It's practical. Okay, that's a that's a good point. Um, right, but uh, I guess this is also a little uh, musser to someone who did miss shema ever. That uh, look at what the Gemara says, that you're supposed to feel, if you miss Shema, you should feel like you never said Shema in your lifetime. And if well, you didn't feel that, that means you're, you're missing a little of the Yiddish uh, feeling that you're supposed to feel so cherished, cherishing mitzvahs, that if you miss Shema once, you should feel that you never, that you, that you, that you never said Shema. That's how a person should feel, sort of like a little musser over here that, uh, you should you should have felt that way. Did you, did you feel bad? You, you missed Shema. Did you feel how bad did you feel? You know. So um, anyway, so the uh, Gemara continues over here and says that Haskes, another uh, 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 teaching on this uh, verse, it says Haskes, which uh, we we translate it as it means uh, uh, listen, uh, pay attention, uh, listen up. Asu kitois kitois the iskubatera hasgeis means that you should make groups and study Torah because has is from the, it sounds like the same word as asu like uh, do make create and kat is uh, used for it's used like when you talk about witnesses you have uh, kite edim uh, kat of edim a group of witnesses so a kat is a group so you should make groups and study Torah. Why? It's not a word in Aramaic or in any other language. Is it a word in Hebrew? Kat? Kof? No, no. 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 Askate. Askate oh. is not a word in Hebrew as far as I know. But it's, it's in the Torah. Yeah. Askate yeah, to Shema Yisrael. Yeah, it's not, it's not used in Hebrew. Huh? It could not be Aramaic. It may, maybe it is. A, in other words, there's there's words in the in the Torah that are that are uh, Lush and Mitzri. Is yeah. uh, there, there, you know, you do have Yigar Sahadusa is Aramaic, right? Yeah. You do have some words, uh, uh, because I looked in the dictionary, I couldn't find it in here. Find it, uh huh. Okay, yes, uh, David, is in Kat what they called what the Misnagdom called the Hasidim? Well, Kat, like yeah, a, it would be a group, like a yes, sect. that's true, yeah, yeah, sect, right. But it, it means a group also. It's it's a, it's used for witnesses in the Gemara and the Mishnayis, a kat of Adam, a group. So it's uh, you should have groups and you should study Torah like we do. Torah is only acquired when you have a group. And that's where we had all these verses yeah, uh, that we learned yesterday. Like Rabbi Yisrael Hanina says, how important it is to learn with other people. And Rabbi Yisrael Hanina, Rabbi Yisrael Hanina says, My dechsev cherev al abadim. Venoyalu, that uh, the sword should go on the badim, people who learn alone. Venoyalu, and we'll, we'll soon say it means that they will become foolish. Venoyalu. Cherev al sanem shal tamin a sword on the, it literally means on the uh, enemies of the Torah scholars. But it uses that again, as we just said earlier, you have to be careful with your words. So the Gemara often, when it wants to say something negative, about the Jewish people, it says the enemies of the Jewish people, the enemies of the Tamid Chachamim, even though it refers to the scholars, that they deserve a sword because they're sheyoshvin bad bad because they're engaged in, in Torah study alone. They sit alone and learn Torah. And um, uh, so it's, it's a euphemism for uh, when it says the, the enemies of the scholars. It really refers to the scholars because it's considered a uh, it's considered a, it's wrong it's considered a sin like not only that but they uh they become uh, uh 
the mistake they make mistakes they tip shim they become foolish or uh the and um it says over here uh that nayalu and it says nayalnu which means uh which which says ashel nayalnu ashel khatana we acted uh foolishly and we sinned in another verse so nayalu would probably be a similar meaning as nayalnu and what it means is that they acted we acted foolishly but nayalu means and they become foolish so not only that but they sin they're, they're sinners by doing this, by learning alone. Shinemar, because it says, Va'asher Chatanu, that in the same verse where it says Nayalu, it says a Nayalnu, it says Chatanu. So where here it says Nayalu, it also means Chatanu, it also includes Chatanu. In other words, so the Gemara is expounding on it that it ba- basically includes a number of uh, problems where, by uh, learning Torah alone. And the Gemara then says, or you could say a source. That um, that foolishness uh, comes together with hate, with sin, from the from the place where it says "noyalu sare soyan," and in that verse it says the the ministers of soyan have become uh, acted foolishly; they become foolish, and uh, it uses the term "toyu to." I, I gave that. I, I read the verse yesterday where it says "hitu hitu es mitzrayim." So it uses the same concept as um, um, sinning. So they, so basically, whenever it says nayalu, it basically means sin. And then the Gemara says a new, a new, a new, a new teaching of 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 haske sushma yisrael. Dover acher another pshat haske sushma yisrael. Pay attention and hear Israel. Kitsu, what does haske mean? So kitsu atzmachem al divrei Torah. You should chop yourselves, grind yourselves on the words of Torah, which means put uh, put all your energy into it. And um, uh, 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 there's a the, the the word kat is used as kits kitsu or uh, koises to 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 uh, to chop to crush. So that the Amarish Lakish, like Rish Lakish says, the Amarish Lakish. Uh, the words of Torah can only be uh, exist and they last by someone who uh, literally kills himself on the words of Torah. It says, This is the Torah. This is literally, it's referring to these are the laws of Tuma, a person who dies in a tent, and there's laws of Tuma. But the Gemara is expounding that it means. This is the way to have Taira, Adam ki yamas ba'ayal, if a person, um, um, if a person, uh, so to speak, uh, kills himself, so to speak, in the tent, which means he limits his indulging in physical pleasures, then he can actually absorb Taira. I was just speaking to a doctor yesterday uh, uh, who's uh, uh, quite a knowledgeable uh, uh, Torah scholar, and he was mentioning to me, that the reason why we have such issues with overeating today is because people are hungry for something. They don't know what they're hungry for. They think they're hungry for food. But really, what they're hungry for is words of Torah. So, um, so Argumar says that a person has to uh, build themselves, meaning have less indulging in physical pleasures, and that's how they'll succeed in Torah. It actually is, it fits very well because that's exactly what you're hungry for. You don't always realize it, but you're really, that's really what you're hungering. Your hunger is really, and your thirst is for Torah. And so by indulging in other pleasures, you sort of, you're missing out that that whole, your your, your whole hunger, you're not feeding your hunger. Your hunger really is in Torah. Yes, uh, Ben. I wanted to say, I found the word as get in two parts in the dictionary. Ah. As we know means, Silence, yeah. silence, not quiet, uh, silence, don't say a thing. And cut means a sect or a, or a group, yes. Yeah. So maybe saying silence and listen Israel. Yeah, well, the Gemara is trying to, don't argue, the Gemara is telling us what Haskes means. You're right that it's a hard, it's a word that's not so clear. 
because yeah. the Gemara itself says, well, we got to translate it. And the Gemara comes up with a few explanations. What is Haskish? Right. So right. it's giving us these, or it's telling us, in other words, your, your point is very valid. The Gemara is expounding on this word uh, seemingly because it's not a, it's not a very uh, uh, well-known word. So the Gemara expounds that it either means uh, ketois, you should make groups, or yeah, it it's, should, it's two things you, put together. You crush yourself. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay, Zaygazunt, everyone. Thank you, Have Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi.